Today's webinar is the fifth in our series. The title of the webinar today and this program is Benefit Design and Payment Reform, a Powerful Pair for Change. I encourage you to go back and see previous webinars if you haven't seen them yet, and also um, to stay tuned for the other five that will be coming up in the series. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenters for today's session. Suzanne Del Banco is the Executive Director of Catalyst for Payment Reform, an independent nonprofit corporation working on behalf of large healthcare purchasers to catalyze improvements on how we pay for health services and how to promote better and higher value care in the United States. In addition to her duties at CPR, Suzanne serves on the coordinating committee of the Measures Application Partnership for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Healthcare Incentives Improvement Institute Board, and she participates in the Healthcare Executives Leadership Network. Mark Ganya, who many of you know, is a co-owner and chief innovation officer of Borislow Insurance. Located in the greater Boston area, Mark's agency is highly regarded as a leading employee benefits brokerage and consulting firm, serving over 350 corporate and 2,000 individual clients and more than 100,000 members in 35 states across the country. Mark has more than 25 years of experience in the healthcare industry and is a pioneer in the use of consumer-driven health and wellness plans to lower healthcare costs and to, promote, and to improve health and well-being. Mark is passionate, as you'll see, about the power of consumerism and as well as health and wellness to transform workplace culture. He's a member of the board of directors for the Massachusetts Health Connector and is the chair of the National Association of Health Underwriters uh, Trans Quality and Transparency Committee. He's certified PPACA and self-funding expert by NEHU, and his unique ability is developing innovative solutions to complex challenges. I'll turn the program over now to Mark and Suzanne. Good morning, NEHU. Good morning. Hopefully everybody had a lot of fun last night. No, I don't know why we're up this early in the morning, but <laughs> I'm certainly hopeful everybody had a lot of fun. I know I did. Suzanne, welcome to our, to our annual convention. Thank you. This morning we're going to talk about benefit design and payment reform and how the two can work together. <clears throat> I thought we'd start out with a little introduction to kind of get your minds going in the right direction. Economics uh, explains how people interact with markets to get what they want and to accomplish certain goals. And supply and demand, if any of us remember back to the days in college of looking at both supply and demand curve relative to economics, are the backbone of a free market economy and describes how prices vary uh, based on availability and demand of a product or a service. Uh, health insurance is expensive, as we all know, because health care is expensive. Transparency of cost and quality, combined with benefit design and payment reform, uh, will lower costs and improve quality. And really, it's simple economics. For the, past, uh, for the next 60 minutes, we'll talk about the economics of health care and the delicate balance between both supply and demand to help us improve quality and lower cost of health care. So you might wonder why in one discussion do we want to talk about payment reform and benefit design together. And my organization, Catalyst for Payment Reform, works with large employers and other big health care purchasers who want to get better value for their spending. What they're very accustomed to and comfortable with is benefit design. That's really their wheelhouse. What they're not really accustomed to thinking about is how we pay doctors and hospitals and why it might be important to change the way we pay doctors and hospitals to get better value. And what we are trying to uh, help everybody think about is why it's important to think about both, both benefit design and payment reform, and how if the two work in concert together, we can end up with much better value and have the healthcare system deliver higher quality and more affordable care. Um, so they're equally important in my mind. And what's really been interesting over the last 10 to 15 years for all of you, I'm sure, is how rapidly the meaning of benefit design has changed. Rather than just being about you know, how big is the deductible and how big is coinsurance, um, there is all kinds of engineering happening uh, with benefit designs to try to get uh, consumers and sometimes patients, meaning consumers are sometimes patients, to actually 
uh, think more carefully about their lifestyle choices, their choice of provider, their choice of treatment, how they use the healthcare system, what providers they seek care from. And so there's great potential still with further experimentation on benefit design. And same is true for payment reform. We're trying to figure out how to line up all the incentives so at the end of the day, patients get the right care at the right time in the right way from the right provider and everybody uh, is better off. Now what's been really interesting as my organization has focused on learning about payment reform and how much it's happening and whether it's working is that some payment reforms have been very slow to take off. And in some cases, those are reforms to how we pay doctors and hospitals that hold the most promise. And in fact, even research shows they show the most promise in terms of improving quality and reducing costs. But it's a big and challenging step for providers to change the way they're getting paid. They have to re-engineer the way that they process uh, their billing. They have to think differently about their patients. They have to think differently about how they collaborate with other providers. All of that takes a big leap of faith unless there's something in it for them. We have to somehow convince them that it's worth taking new forms of payment. And one of the ways we can do that is through benefit design and steering more patients their way if they're willing to do the right thing on behalf of their patients. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, we're here to talk about this th during this hour because we really believe that lining up benefit designs and payment reform can be a very powerful pair. And the good news is this audience is experts in benefit design. Right. Uh, also, mm -hmm. too, with regard to providers, it's nice to have them come to the party because all of us are dealing with those concerns as well mm -hmm. relative to how we structure things. Um, so I look forward to our discussion this morning. So I thought it might be helpful, even though I'm talking to a very educated audience, to talk about the benefit design types that we see in play today. Now, keep in mind, I work with very large employers and big public purchasers like state employee and retiree agencies. So they may be implementing benefit designs that are slightly different from some of the entities that you work with who might be smaller. But what we're seeing are five major different types of benefit design being put into use. There's the uh, cost sharing that's been around for quite some time, tweaking uh, co-insurance, uh, deductibles, co-pays, and things like that. That still remains. And in fact, Mark will get into a little bit more detail about how, especially on the deductible side, there's obviously been a lot of change. Um, there are also, as I mentioned a minute ago, financial incentives around lifestyle choices and use of services. And by that I mean things like uh, consumer-directed health care, value-based insurance design that the last webinar covered, where there are incentives given to a consumer to make the right choice, whether of treatment or of a uh, provider, or encouraging them to get preventive care that whether uh, they aren't yet ill or if they have a chronic disease will keep them out of the hospital. Um, value-based benefit, in, uh, sorry, value, uh, value-based insurance design has grown in uh, popularity. A third category we see, uh, and this is something I think that our members at CPR, the big employers, have gotten pretty comfortable with, are incentives to choose certain healthcare providers. And those are usually based on some kind of quality and cost criteria. Uh, we've got reference pricing, centers of excellence, and narrow networks. And we'll talk about all of those in greater detail in a moment. Another category of benefit design change that we see are sort of broadly we're calling policies. So, you know, prior authorization has been around for a long time, so has referral to specialists, but we're seeing even more tweaks around, you know, how much uh, of a prescription can you fill? Is it 30 days? Is it 90 days? Depending on how you get your drugs, et cetera. So there's a whole category there um, uh, sort of ripe for experimentation further. And then lastly, even though it's not technically benefit design, the input of transparency into the equation um, I think has made a big difference and in fact it's required for some of these other types of benefit design changes to work. Consumers need to know about the quality of care being offered by different providers. They need to know about the price of services before they seek care. And so the whole transparency movement, which has really transformed the healthcare system over the last 15 years in quality, maybe the last five years in price, um, has been a very important building block to some of the benefit design changes and payment reforms we're seeing in the marketplace. And the good news with transparency, as we all know from our earlier webcast, if you can't see it, you can't measure it. And if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So this audience is particularly passionate about transparency of right. healthcare costs and quality. Yeah. And I'll say, just to add on to Mark's point, that transparency, I think first and foremost, we think of it as a consumer's right to know. 
but it really can have sort of more macroeconomic effects on a marketplace when people understand how much variation there is and how much we're paying for the same kind of care. We understand how much quality might vary. It really creates some pressure on the supply side of the healthcare system to make sure that they're in line with, with uh, what's reasonable. And so that's gonna be very helpful, I think, over time in trying to secure better value healthcare. So I talked for a moment there about stuff you know very well, which is the benefit designs that are in the marketplace today. And I wanted to kind of do the parallel with payment reform. And this might be an area that some of you think about a little bit less. Um, for those of you for whom this is uh, remedial learning, bear with me for a moment. Um, so there really has been an evolution in our thinking about the way we pay for healthcare. Historically in this country, we have largely paid on a fee for service basis. And I think all of you know what that means. We pay for every little procedure, test, office visit, uh, diagnosis that takes place. And it's all like ordering off of an off of a, a la carte menu. Um, and the good part about that is there are very um, few perverse incentives around providing enough care. So if you were ever worried about someone not getting enough care, fee-for-service really provides the right incentives for providers to want to deliver as much care and as expensive care as possible. Um, now, if you move all the way from the left side of this image to the right, you start lumping payments for services uh, in bigger and bigger bundles. So uh, if you want to pay a single package price for an episode of care like a hip replacement, which we'll give some examples about in a moment, um, you could create a bundled payment that was almost like paying for a um, vacation package where it's all inclusive and you know that your flight and your rental car and your hotel and your meals are included because you're going to a, a resort that does that sort of thing. Um, so bundled payment lumps things for either a, uh, maybe a surgical procedure or a chronic care episode and helps create incentives for providers to work more closely together um, and to also make sure that they don't go over budget because they know how much they're gonna get paid in total for providing that episode of care. And all the way to the right, you see the idea of either what we called in the old days capitation or global payment where there is a set payment for a patient for a given time period, typically a year. And uh, again, it increases complexity um, in terms of uh, calculating what that payment should be and what the provider needs to do to fare well under that payment, but it also increases accountability on the part of the provider. So what we're seeing in the marketplace now is every form of payment that's described here in this evolution all taking place simultaneously. What we also know is that all of them could be improved, especially by making sure that they're taking into account the need to support higher quality care, or that these payments could become, in fact, reflective of the level of quality, rewarding providers who do a good job. Um, so that just describes sort of the evolution and the spectrum of payment reform. And the next slide, I, what I wanna go over are examples of what you might see in the marketplace. So I talked about fee-for-service, I mentioned bundled payment, I talked about global payment. What's interesting is you can bucket all of the different methods being tried in the marketplace today around how we pay doctors and hospitals into three categories. First category is one where there is upside potential for providers, meaning they could stand to earn more or, uh, or earn back what it is that they would like to be earning through performance. So we've seen a lot of implementation over the last 15 years and it, there's been a spike in its growth over the last two years of what we call pay for performance, where there are certain quality measures that providers are held accountable for, and if they perform well on them, they stand to earn greater uh, uh, payment. Um, so that's an example of an upside-only payment method. There are also some methods on the market now that are downside-only. So for example, if a hospital, uh, uh, during the course of a patient's stay, is responsible for that patient getting a hospital-acquired infection that was not present when the patient uh, was admitted to the hospital, they no longer get paid for the extra care it, t it, it will require to make sure that that patient recovers from that infection. So that is what we call downside risk only, meaning if a uh, provider doesn't perform well, they just stand to lose money, and so that really gets their attention. Um, and then the other type of method that we're seeing in the marketplace is where there's both upside and downside risk. So a provider, if they do well on quality and do well on their spending, could potentially share in some savings as an example. And if they do poorly on quality or they overspend, they are responsible for eating those costs. 
And that is um, very much like the downside risk I just described, but they have the opportunity for both and whatever the payment arrangement is. So um, I won't go into great detail on all the items listed here, but I think that gives you a good sense of the kinds of methods that are being tried in the marketplace. Now, you might not be surprised to know that when we're in a transition mode and trying to encourage providers to take new forms of payment, you can imagine which type we start with. We typically start with the carrot and offer upside-only uh, payment methods. And then over time, as they get used to the quality measurement component, they get used to how their payment might be variable based on performance, um, we slowly but surely could try to migrate them to taking more risk. And that's really what's happening with the experimentation in the marketplace today. What do you think the appetite is in the marketplace for providers to actually be measured on their quality? And do you think the current infrastructure with regard to technology and the ability to measure that, do you think we're where we need to be yet, or do you think we have a, a long way to go yeah. relative to that? You know, I think that most healthcare providers are used to being measured. These are type A people who did really well in school, and they're used to you know, competing with their peers. So the idea of measurement is something that providers, I think, are very comfortable with. Public reporting on that measurement is something that has taken some time to get used to. Um, and so that's really what's different now than it was 15 years ago, is that there are public reports on quality, whether it's uh, reports issued by our, our government, by state government, or by nonprofit organizations, there's more and more transparency around the quality, and there is some resistance to that still. We have a lot of debate over what quality measures are fair, what measures will take into account how sick my patients are versus yours. Probably so there's still a lot of debate about that. I think the good news is that our, our infrastructure for quality measurement and for reporting is slowly getting better. There is much greater use of electronic health records than there used to be, um, electronic medical records, and all of that will make quality measurement and reporting more automated and less uh, cumbersome, um, but we still have a ways to go. So again, going back to the Economics 101 lesson that Mark started <laughs> us with, um, uh, today, what we want to talk about is the importance of aligning the incentives on the supply side with those on the demand side. And by demand side, I mean the patients who are ultimately seeking care. Um, as I mentioned, there have been some methods of payment that we know are very promising that it's been very hard to get healthcare providers to take on. An example is bundled payment. Um, I'll share with you in a moment what we found about how much bundled payment there is in the marketplace, but suffice it to say, it's very little. Why should a provider who has a claim system in their office that is accustomed to generating fee-for-service claims um, suddenly uh, want to invest a lot of money in changing how they process that, in coming up with ways to measure their quality on a near real-time basis? There has to be something in it for them. Obviously, healthcare providers are professionals. They want to make people's lives better. But in the, you know, the, on the um, treadmill that they're on, there isn't necessarily a lot of impetus for really stepping back and re-engineering the way that they're providing care. And so um, we have heard again and again from providers that one thing that could convince them to really try to change is if they had the promise of more volume, if more patients would come their way as a result of their investments and their efforts. And so um, I think we have to ask ourselves, you know, why should providers take on new forms of payment, you know, uh, subject themselves to quality measurement and reporting um, if there isn't something in it for them? We're all human beings after all. And then again, on the patient side of the equation or the consumer or the enrollee, whatever you want to call that person, why should they um, reward those providers with their, uh, their business and their visits um, unless there's information for them and there's also incentives for them to make those choices. Now, we like to think that people are going to be rational, give them information, they'll make the right choice, but in fact, it takes more than that. Information alone does not change behavior, and so incentives are also very important, and that's where the benefit design comes in. Yeah, because a missing element in that, that thought process is the emotional aspect of that. The patients are seeing a doctor because they have a problem they need to have fixed, so you've got to get, add that element to, into it as yeah. well. So let me just take a moment to tell you where we are with payment reform. So you know, I hope I've convinced you by now that we've got to focus on both. Do we have payment reforms in the marketplace? Um, so we've been, my organization has been tracking this since uh, 2012. And in fact, I, sh I could say in 2010, we sort of did an informal poll of some of the biggest health insurers in the country to ask them what proportion of payments at that time were tied to performance. And in 2010, it was about one to 3%. 
Well, we have seen a flurry of activity. And in fact, to quote one health insurance executive that I work with, she said, it is an arms race out there. We are working fast and furiously to be, have the most payment reform compared to our competitors. And so we're seeing a huge changeover as provider contracts come up for renewal in the methods that, pay, that uh, health plans are using to pay providers. And in fact, we're at a place now where uh, 40 out of every $100 we're spending on, on healthcare right now is flowing through some method of payment reform whether it's pay for performance or bundled payment or some of the shared savings and shared risk models that I alluded to. So that's a huge, huge change. But we're also seeing um, that uh, there's still very little payment reform when it comes to specialty care. There's more in the hospital setting, I think, frankly, because quality measurement is easier in that setting. Sure. Um, and there's a lot more in primary care than specialty care, which I think is very interesting. And I think that's really related to the movement around what we call patient-centered medical homes, where we want primary care to have a bigger role in the healthcare system because we know it can lead to better care for patients and also more cost-effective care. But in the face of all of this, you know, this is great progress. Our organization, Catalyst for Payment Reform, wanted to be a catalyst in creating more payment reform in the marketplace. But we don't know yet whether all these reforms are going to pan out for us. We don't know if they're actually going to lead to higher quality care. We don't know if they're going to save money. And in fact, you know, healthcare costs in certain areas continue to rise, um, even though there's been some uh, leveling of that over the last uh, five years. Um, and there are very few signs as of yet that quality is improving across the board. So um, what we are now on a mission at my organization to make sure is that we don't do all of this effort around reforming payment and end up with absolutely no benefit from it except for a big intellectual exercise and a lot of headache. So um, <laughs> That doesn't sound like a yeah. good idea. So, so again, <laughs> uh, you know, benefit design is going to be critical to making sure that these payment reforms not only stick but uh, are as powerful and effective as they can be. So in terms of the demand side, how much benefit design is there? Um, you guys know this better than I do. So me throwing some statistics at you is probably not that meaningful. But we know that there's a much greater shifting of financial responsibility to the consumer. We know that more and more consumers are being asked to take on a greater share out of, um, in general, and that also the way that their benefits are being designed is requiring them to be more and more the financial stewards um, of the resources that are given to them through an employer or through with some other means, uh, and even including, of course, their own money. Um, and so more and more consumers are being encouraged to shop for care, whether it's just based on price or ideally on quality and price. And um, there's also, for the first time, really, I think, since the 90s, a willingness on the part of both employers and consumers to have some restrictions placed on which providers they could have access to. I think people thought for a very long time that that was simply un-American. <laughs> and now that we've had much more revealed to us about how much quality does vary and how much prices do vary, I think people realize that sometimes they're not getting a great deal and that maybe it's worth uh, doing a little bit of homework in advance and uh, choosing among providers that are known to offer better quality. Um, so I think one big question this leaves us with, with is, is there sufficient transparency in the marketplace uh, no. around quality and price? I would argue no. To support... I think this audience would argue yeah, no, too. Yeah, to support these kinds of benefit changes. And are there incentives for consumers to make the right decisions that are strong enough? And I think those are questions we could all discuss and debate. So let's talk for a moment about consumer-driven health plans, a subject that most of us, probably all of us, are very familiar with. Let's first talk about the principles of consumer-driven health, because I think a lot of people dive into the mechanics without really understanding what the design from a philosophical standpoint means. The principles of CDH are transparency. As I said earlier, if you can't see it, you can't measure it. If you can't measure it, you can't improve it. And if we're going to ask consumers to be uh, stewards of their own financial and their own health, they need to have that information available to them so that they can act responsibly, which is the second principle. And then the opportunity uh, bears with having that responsibility of taking care of, better care of themselves and then making an informed purchasing choice when they have a health care event they need to deal with. Structurally, CDHPs, and, and this one thing that really drives me crazy is the media, how they mischaracterize a CDHP as a high deductible health plan. That's like saying a car is a car without an engine. It's not a car. It's a chassis. So the, the CDHP is a combination of a qualified high deductible health plan 
paired with a health care account that can be structured either as a health reimbursement arrangement or as a health savings account. CDHPs ask consumers uh, to be engaged. Uh, we all are engaged, obviously, because of the health care event we're having, but also because of the cost uh, that we bear to, to treat ourselves. Uh, so to be engaged, to be educated, and to be empowered is probably the most important uh, aspect here, to make informed health care choices and to live a healthy lifestyle. And when you have an event that you're getting high quality health care at a lower cost. If we take a look at the mechanical design of a CDHP, it really breaks itself into four, four components. The first is consumer driven health plans are like any other form of insurance. They provide comprehensive insurance protection. Where they are different though is that they introduce a qualified front end deductible. And that front end deductible does two things. One, it illuminates the cost. So many folks are still on a copay, amazingly enough, where they don't see the actual cost of the care. So the first thing a deductible does is introduce them to that cost, the actual real contracted cost of that service. The problem is they don't see that contracted cost right now until after they've had a healthcare event as opposed to before. And we know we're working on, on changing that. The second thing the uh, front end deductible does is it reduces the premium. So I wish we actually labeled this a low premium plan as opposed to a high deductible <laughs> health plan. If I asked the audience, how many of you want a uh, a high deductible health plan, not many people would raise their hand. If I asked you if you wanted a lower premium plan, you probably would raise your hand. And language is important. Uh, titles are important. So I think that's an important aspect of it. What, what employers do or individuals do then with that lower premium they're paying, when it's designed correctly, is they're then channeling a portion of that premium savings into a health care account, whether it be a health reimbursement arrangement, which as we all know, the employer is the only one who can fund that account. It's an employer driven vehicle. But in a health savings account, that individual, if they're really educated properly, they're taking that premium savings and they're not putting it in their bank account. They're putting it into a health savings account because that money is tax preferred. It goes in pre-tax, it grows pre-tax, and then when the money comes out and is used on qualified medical expenses, it actually comes out with no tax. It's the only uh, account structure of its kind in the IRS code. I call it the triple crown, if you will, with regard to its ability to increase an individual's purchasing power. And then finally, and probably most importantly about these designs, and I don't think there's enough talk about this, is that wellness needs to be wrapped around a consumer-driven health plan. And what do I mean by that? Well, there really are five elements of wellness. I think traditionally we've talked about physical wellness, and that's one aspect of a whole person. Now, the other elements are you have physical, you have financial, you have workplace, you have community, and then you have mind and spirit. And if you wrap a wellness program structured like that around a consumer-driven health plan, then not only are you giving people access to information that engages them, you're asking them to be educated, but you're then also empowering them to live a healthy lifestyle. And the reality is, none of us want to get sick. So to the extent that we can avoid being ill by taking better care of ourselves, and when we have a healthcare event, that we actually know what we're purchasing and what the quality is and what it costs, we can actually then begin to be empowered consumers. So I wanted to talk just briefly about CDHPs because I think there's a lot of misinterpretation of exactly what they are. And I think words are important. And labeling things as a high deductible really does not do these plans any service. Yeah, I think the idea of calling it low premium, someone missed that opportunity, huh? Yeah, a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, so, um, I think building on that, I was just going to give you a few examples here um, of the kinds of pairings that could be very powerful. And I'll start each of them by describing what the benefit design is and then what payment form you could pair it with that could really lead to better uh, value for the consumer and better care overall. So the first one I'm going to talk about is reference pricing. And I think many of you are familiar with what reference pricing is. It is this idea that if you create a price that you think is reasonable in a given marketplace for a certain service, you then say that this is the maximum that will be covered for that service and that any amount above it needs to be shouldered by the consumer. So to give an example, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area and there there was research done showing that you could pay anywhere from hundreds to thousands of dollars for a screening colonoscopy with the same kind of anesthesia. And so Safeway um, pioneered this concept of reference pricing uh, beyond pharmaceuticals where it had been into medical care and came up with a reference price for the San Francisco Bay Area for a colonoscopy of around $1,200. And so if a patient wanted to get one, let's say at $1,800, 
they would have to pay that $600 on top of what their basic insurance coverage was for it. Um, and the idea there is to both send a signal to providers in the marketplace that anyone who's pricing their colonoscopies above $1,200, it's too expensive, they should bring their prices down, and it's to create an uh, incentive for the consumer to choose a colonoscopy with a provider where the price is reasonable, because either at or below that price, they're going to get uh, the full benefit of their insurance coverage. So um, using that as an example, um, if we go to the next slide, um, you could picture how pairing reference pricing with bundled payment might make a lot of sense, especially for an episode of care. So let's take the idea of a hip and knee replacement, hip or knee replacement rather, um, and let's say you set a reference price for a hip replacement at $30,000. Now the bummer would be is if you told that to a consumer and so they said, okay, I'm going to try to find a provider who will give me that procedure for $30,000 or less. But if that provider is still paid on a fee-for-service basis, maybe you'll get a price for the actual surgery in the hospital, but that probably doesn't include stuff that happens before the operation. It doesn't include physical therapy after. It might not include the anesthesia. It might not include all kinds of ancillary services that are really part of that episode. So imagine if they, the provider was willing to take a bundled payment for everything that was included, and they're partnering with all the other providers that are involved in the entire episode of care, so that when you told that patient the price tag was $30,000, it really was $30,000. There wouldn't be bills coming later that would be a surprise, uh, because actually the anesthesiology group isn't part of the hospital. They're independent, and actually the physical therapy that you need afterwards, oh yeah, that wasn't included, but that's going to go on for several months. So um, the idea of having a bundled payment means that the reference price truly is the, re the um, uh, sorry, the, that the choice that the consumer is making under the reference pricing scheme truly is um, going to be all that they're going to have to pay. On the other hand, for a provider, again, to be willing to re-engineer things to accept a bundled payment, knowing that there's reference pricing in the marketplace around the service that they're providing means that they know that they stand to gain potentially more patients coming their way and so they might be more willing to take that bundled payment. Um, and it also gives them some guidance around what kind of cost they need to get under control to succeed with that reference price in the marketplace and sort of where to price their bundle. So these two can work together very beautifully. And a good example of where this happened was in California. CalPERS, which is the state uh, employee and retiree organization, did this for joint replacements. And they were able to um, successfully shift where many consumers were seeking care. They had some providers in the marketplace come and negotiate for a lower price because they wanted to be within the reference price. And all of this led to a very positive scenario for both patients and ultimately for providers. If you go to the next example, Let's talk about value-based insurance design for a moment. And I know for those of you who attended the last webinar, you got a lot of tutelage on this, so I don't need to go into great detail. But value-based insurance design is the idea of creating incentives for consumers to seek healthcare in a way that is ultimately beneficial to them, whether it is seeking preventive services that they might not bother with otherwise, or they might avoid because of the expense. Uh, let's say someone who has diabetes and it encourages them to get their chronic uh, you know, meds that they need to take on a regular basis. Um, and it also extends into choice of provider and choice of treatment. Um, but we're seeing more and more value-based insurance design, especially being used around preventive services. Now imagine if you were to pair this uh, with uh, shared savings. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, so if value-based insurance design is encouraging people who are not yet sick to get preventive care that helps them avoid becoming sick, or people who have chronic conditions to avoid those conditions, you know, sending them to the hospital, um, then that matches very well with a scenario where providers are under some kind of shared savings arrangement. They want to make sure to keep people out of the hospital. They want to make sure to keep their care as less, you know, as as um, inexpensive as possible because that increases the odds that there will be savings compared to some benchmark that's been set for them um, that will enable them <coughs> ultimately to earn more money. So these are a very nice pairing on both sides. For value-based insurance design for the patient, it means that the provider is very incented to create uh, uh, strong preventive care. And for uh, the provider, uh, they know that if they do that, then they can uh, potentially share in some savings. So let's go to the next example. 
Uh, narrow networks are getting a lot of discussion these days. And the idea here is that you essentially draw a circle around providers in a given community um, and include in that circle providers who meet some kind of criteria around quality and cost. And you essentially say to patients, if you want to get care, you have to go to a provider within this narrow network unless there's some great exception that maybe is listed somewhere. Um, and by creating a narrow network, it means that you are helping consumers ultimately eliminate going to either very high cost or potentially very poor quality providers. Um, and uh, as uh, uh, the example says here, you know, you can go to hospital, uh, doctor, or hos uh, doctor A or hospital A, and the plan will pay all or most of the bill, or go to doctor B or hospital B, and the, role, and the enrollee may have to pay uh, most of the bill if it's outside of that narrow network. Um, so let's talk about how narrow network and payment reform can be combined. So imagine um, that uh, you are a provider and you meet certain criteria and you're in negotiations with a health insurer. The health insurer says to you, I will include you in the narrow network if you are willing to take on some shared risk around the payment arrangements that we create for you. So in other words, if I include you, I want you to maintain your high level of value, that was why we selected you in the first place, and improve upon it. Um, and we're going to create some very strong incentives for you to do that. Um, and on the flip side, it means that patients who are opting to be in that narrow network know that they are going to be going to providers who are working very hard to make sure that quality is high and that costs are as low as possible. So in other words, uh, a, an example of a good pairing. Uh, Intel has done something like this in New Mexico with Presbyterian Health System, where they created an ACO-like arrangement, and essentially was a plan option that, that their enrollees could choose, and if they seek care there, um, they have higher coverage, um, and Presbyterian Health gets a lot more volume uh, by offering this kind of arrangement that has both shared costs and shared savings. Now, it's early days in this experiment, we have seen some examples of where quality has improved for patients. Um, there's improvement in diabetic care as an example. Um, there is much greater screening of people for depression, which we know is done far too uh, rarely in the, in the general healthcare system. What's interesting though, in the early days of a program like this, as you can imagine, costs actually went up because you had people who were seeking care that they had been putting off or encouraged to come in and get uh, more preventive care uh, or early care for a condition than they might have had in the past. But the key will be to watch this over the next few years, and I think people's anticipation is that costs will come down, and in fact, there will be savings, and uh, the providers will not be eating this risk that they have taken on. All right. Um, another example would be, um, I think we've gotten much more smart about the fact that there are some patients in the healthcare system that are what we call sort of high cost, high utilizers. They might have multiple chronic uh, conditions, they have complex conditions, and they really require intensive case management uh, in order to uh, be healthier and happier and also uh, less expensive for the healthcare system. And so we've seen a lot of experimentation with creating very intensive outpatient case management uh, for patients to try to keep them out of the hospital, out of the emergency room, and meet some of their basic needs that were perhaps uh, the reason why they were high utilizers. So imagine if you were to pair uh, case management for high cost employees, go to the next slide, um, with shared risk. Um, so an example of this took place in North Carolina where Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina created an algorithm to identify high utilizers of emergency rooms. And for a group of employers that participated in um, these data being analyzed, the effort to identify uh, high utilizers of the emergency room and educate them about how to use the healthcare system helped them eliminate 1,300 inappropriate ER uh, visits each year. Um, and these kinds of strategies where you're creating intensive case management around these high cost, um, high utilizers uh, would obviously lend themselves well to encouraging providers to take on shared risk. Because if these are expenses that have been racking up, but yet you're able to get them under control where before you could not, um, and there are mechanisms put in place to do that, and these services aren't necessarily provided by the physicians, but sometimes by social workers and others, um, then a provider group might be much more willing to take on shared risk because they know that there's sort of low-hanging fruit, if you will. Not that these patients are easy, 
but that there are very great opportunities for reducing the cost of their care. Um, so that's just another example of where pairing uh, benefit design um, and benefit offerings with payment reform could be very powerful. So from our perspective, before we take some questions, I uh, just thought we'd kind of wrap up a uh, discussion and kind of put a, put a bow around it. We all know in here that health insurance is expensive because health care is expensive. And the reality is the economics of health care require a delicate balance between supply and demand. And Suzanne and I have talked about it. Actually, supply and demand works better when there's a real free market. We would both argue that there's probably not a real free market in health care, and that's part of the challenge that we have today. Transparency of health care cost and quality combined with benefit design uh, and payment reform will lower cost and improve quality. It's really, frankly, basic economics. Uh, if doctors and patients work together in the same direction, create a collaborative team effort, uh, outcomes and value are more likely to improve. And that's kind of the direction that we think things are moving in. So with that being said, that's a formal part of our presentation. Uh, if any of you would like to ask a question, there are two microphones, uh, both on each aisle. We would love to, uh, to have you uh, engage with us and uh, share your thinking. We have one gentleman coming up on the left over here. Good morning. Good David morning. Contorno. Um, I do believe in the reference-based pricing model, but I'm starting to get a lot of pushback as more and more employers adopt it, that uh, it conflicts with certain provisions of the ACA around unlimited care, uh, particularly on you know, certain of the essential health benefits. How are you guys dealing with that in the plan documents or the, the design of the plans? And do you think it really is an issue, or is it just sort of the people who are against Obamacare trying to push back? Do you want to answer that? You want no, me to? So, um, <laughs> I'm going to buddy pass that No, that's fine. You. That's fine. Um, I, I just didn't know how much you had dealt with no, it no, yourself. No. Um, so this was a very big question for the big employers that my organization works with. Um, some of them were the early adopters of reference pricing, and they were worried when the Affordable Care Act got passed and there hadn't been sort of full interpretation of what the law meant, that they might need to end their programs or that they would be in violation of the, of the law. Um, there was, uh, and I wish I could remember how to refer to it formally, but there, there was finally um, some clarity provided by the federal government, and the federal government does remain supportive of reference pricing, uh, and you know because at the end of the day, it's it's uh, it is in line with the goals of the Affordable Care Act, not so much on the insurance coverage side, but on the improvement in value and, and quality side. And um, so our members have been reassured that it's fine to proceed. And we are seeing not maybe as fast growth as we thought we would see, but we are seeing growth of reference pricing. Uh, and people are using it for mostly, I would say, more pedestrian services where they know that consumers are more likely to shop around, whether it's for labs or screening tests or some procedures that are elective. Um, but uh, our members at least have been reassured now that it is fine to proceed. Uh, Mark and Suzanne, we have some pre-submitted questions from registration yesterday that Bob would like to share. Great. Thank you. Hi, Bob. Hi, Mark. How Hello, are Mark. you? Hi, Suzanne. The, we had some questions ahead of time, so let me read one to you. How can we ensure that our clients, how can we ensure our clients that narrow network plans will provide the comprehensive coverage that they need? Mm. Go ahead. Okay. I, I, I think that's a really great I have question. Some thoughts there too. Yeah, and, and, and Mark and I may see this differently. I don't know. I think we're going to. Um, I, I, think, <laughs> I think that narrow networks are very challenging. Um, they probably work great for the average patient. The challenge is that when someone gets diagnosed with something very particular, the provider that they really should go to may or may not be in that network. And so how do you account for the fact that that patient really needs to go elsewhere? And in fact, to achieve the benefits of a narrow network, which is to help keep costs down, um, you don't really sort of backfire the situation, not to mention harm that patient because they couldn't get the care that they really should have had. Because this is someone who might get uh, a misdiagnosis or perhaps they might get the wrong treatment for something rare um, and then uh, the bills start mounting. And so I think that narrow networks are great in principle, but in execution there's a lot of detail to figure out in order to make sure that at the end of the day, patients still get access to the right care 
and that ultimately there is a cost savings aspect to them. Yeah, and I think the principles of flexibility and choice are really what rub against me here in this particular example. We're restricting choice, we're restricting access, all under the guise that this is going to improve quality and lower cost. So I'll use a real example in Massachusetts. Um, I have, we have a client that want, and wants to get hip, uh, hip replacement, well, don't want to, but have to. Um, and they did some checking and found out that the hip replacement surgery was gonna cost, in their narrow network, $60,000. Then they did some domestic medical tourism, which we're you know, educating them about. And because they're on a PPO plan, they said, okay, well, can we go somewhere else in the country that might be able to deliver the same care at a lower cost with higher quality? So we looked at an organization called the Oklahoma Surgery Center. And you know the Oklahoma Surgery Center posts its prices on its website. That same hip surgery with higher quality was one third of the cost. So instead of sixty thousand dollars in that quote unquote narrow network with higher quality, lower cost, it's twenty thousand dollars in another place. So that's where the rub comes to me. If I think the premise of restricting access to drive volume is going to lower cost, the, the practical reality is in the example I just gave you. That's not the case. So how, how would you react to that? Yeah, I think we're saying very much the same thing, mm -hmm. which is that when it comes down to specifics, the narrow net network may or may not serve the patient well. Okay. Um, but I do think that we are naive to think that free choice is always best. And, and what I mean by that is that all choices are not the same. No, that's there, true. There's huge variation in quality and safety. There's huge variation in price. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that there is an argument to be made for homework being done on the part of consumers to help them identify the high value providers, whether it's in a narrow network or a tiered network or in some other kind of uh, benefit design. Uh, I think that we can discuss and debate. But You know, I think one of the things I'd like to ask is, you know, what do you think about a world where we actually don't have networks? where we have published prices like anything else. Because I, I think the whole notion of networks controls, it's, it's the supply controlling the cost. So what do you think about that? You know, we're talking about reference-based pricing, so let me give you an example of what I mean. If the federal government were to disclose what, it, what its contracted costs are, we all know in this room that federal government pays on average 61 cents of, uh, for a dollar of health care, mm -hmm. and in turn the private market needs to pay $1.39. So what do you think about the whole notion of the federal government disclosing here's what we pay as a reference point to ultimately determine what providers are going to be paid? Um, I think that's already happening. Okay. And I think the commercial health plans set their payment amounts off of what Medicare is paying. So I mean, I think that's already happening to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. um, that's a slightly different question from whether or not there should be networks. Sure. And uh, you know, I think that they've become less and less meaningful over time. Um, now the, research, now the growth of narrow networks and tiered networks is an attempt to make them more meaningful. Yes. But originally, you know, health plans would try to compete with each other based on who was in their network. Correct. Then networks became so overlapping that they're really, it was not a no distinguishing. no differentiation. Yeah, it was, right. right, not a distinguishing feature. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think, you know, the pendulum always swings. <laughs> sure, it does. There's a lot of questions, so should yeah. we take some from the audience? Uh, Dave Bordeaux from New Jersey. Okay. Uh, my simple question is what effect do you think the ICD-10 coding will have as far as physicians' attitudes now with a brand new coding system possibly taking place in October? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, new coding is a huge headache. That's why it's been put off for so long. Um, the upside to it, though, I will say, is that there are going to be codes for things that didn't exist before that are very important to capture. And I think that will help with benefit design, and I think that will help with payment reform. So no one likes change, but I think ultimately it's going to be helpful in terms of our ability to track what's actually happening with, with patient encounters. Suzanne, I can't help but think of, I don't know if any of you have seen this commercial where the lady's kind of, she jumps into her husband's arms and he goes to catch her, and then she falls down. There's actually a code for that. Really? <laughs> I mean, that's just amazing. Sorry, I just had to say that because I just thought it was funny. <laughs> Over here. Dave Thule, West hey, Michigan. Uh, under the shared savings arrangement, how much of the savings actually devolve back to the people who pay the premiums? Yeah. That's a great question mm -hmm. and one that we have been starting to ask the health insurers that we work with. As of now, I think there's no evidence that those savings come back to the person who pays the premium. Um, it's really, I think, an attempt to create incentives on the part of the provider. Um, there are arrangements for savings where they're split between the payer and the provider. Whether the payer then 
you know, leads to uh, a reduction in premiums is unclear. It's obviously different for self-insured customers and fully insured, but there's a lot of work to be done to sort of track that and um, to make sure that given that we're asking patients to be part of the solution, that they also can benefit from these efforts. Good morning, Debbie Boop with Ohio Association of Health Underwriters. I have an easy question and a not so easy question. First of all, one of your slides um, mentioned that one of the risks with the hospital payer change models had to do with warranties at hospitals. I'm not familiar with warranties being offered at hospitals. Can you please explain that a little bit? And then the second question has to do with the reference-based pricing. Now, when you eliminate PPO networks, in this scenario, how are the stop loss carriers reacting to that and what trends are you seeing? I'll take the first and I'll give you the second. Sure. Um, so warranties, uh, a famous example would be Geisinger Health System in Pennsylvania where they instituted a program called Proven Care uh, where essentially um, payment for, let's say, uh, open heart surgery uh, would guarantee uh, coverage for any readmission or any care that needed to happen after that for some period of time. So it's the basic idea, it's kind of like bundled payment and saying that you pay me and I will cover you for this much of your episode or this length of time. And relative to the second part of the question, I think you know, stop, loss, uh, stop loss insurers are interested in making sure that they're not overpaying for a particular claim. So the impact of a PPO network or not a PPO network, I think one of the things I'd like to see is the expansion of no networks, but how the insurers or reinsurers are gonna react to that is still somewhat unknown. What are you seeing in the large the large case market with regard to stop loss and the impact? You know, it's not something I've studied so much. That's why I turned it to you. Okay, great. <laughs> Excellent. Nola Wood from Kansas City. Uh, with the trend toward more information and choices, I'm interested to know if you see more of a trend to um, at least providing information about alternative choices, things like chiropractic and nutritional approaches that are very much preventative or may resolve real problems at a much lower cost, you know, a series of chiropractic treatments rather than a back surgery. And of course the MDs have fought this, but uh, I'm interested to know your yeah, thoughts. I, mean, I think this has been a fascinating question to me for a very long time. Um, insurance coverage has typically followed types of care for which there's evidence, you know, and sort of scientific level evidence. And there are a lot of uh, methods of care for which there just hasn't been as much study. And I think nutrition is a great example. There's been so much more uh, over the last few years about how what we eat affects um, our health and both mental and physical. Um, so I think as there is more and more research and evidence that comes on, we will see um, more attention to covering those services and incentives around those services. Um, but I think uh, the model that we've had for a long time around coverage has been follow the evidence. And so I think that's part, part, partly explains uh, where we are today. I don't know and if you want to add anything. Well, I think the, the difference too with Western medicine, we wait to diagnose and then treat, where Eastern medicine is more about prevent uh, in the beginning. So. I think if we can combine the best of Eastern philosophy medicine, which is what you're talking about, chiropractic, acupuncture, uh, homeopathy, naturopathy, I, I, I think we're missing the boat on that uh, as a other way of delivering healthcare. Um, helping people stay healthier and using less invasive forms of care seems to make a lot more sense to me than waiting until something's broken and then trying to fix it. Yeah, I think philosophically that's right. Um, it all depends on the type of care and I mean, I happen to believe that scientific evidence is somewhat important mm -hmm. and some of these uh, types of care have a huge amount of evidence once you study it and some of them don't. So I yeah. think at the end of the day it's about educating the patient and, and making sure that there's coverage for things that do work. And I think Western medicine docs push back a lot on Eastern philosophy as an example. You know, some will uh, poo poo, uh, you know, acupuncture and say, well, it's a newer form of care. I'm like, no, it's been around for thousands and, and of years. And there's, I mean, there's evidence, that's an example <laughs> of where there is evidence. So, right. Yeah. right, right, right. Thank you. Uh, Denny Wright, Indiana. Um, just a comment, and then I'll ask a question. Um, on on the, the plan design initiatives you reviewed, um, in my prior life, I was kind of a naive little TPA in Northeast Indiana, and now I've kind of expanded over maybe four or five states. And one, one of the things I've noticed is there are great um, uh, differences in like the provider um, communities geographically, mm -hmm. how some of these work and how some of these don't work. 
for example, I've seen reference-based pricing um, put in with certain uh, in certain areas. It's a, literally a train wreck. I mean, the providers absolutely they'll 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 even not accept the employer's ID cards, and 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 uh, um, it's 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 been a disaster. And I've seen in other markets where it it, it does work, and. Um, um, I, I guess uh, my question would be, um, how do you see um, the future with, um, I mean, you know, you, you, somebody mentioned they live in, you know, San Francisco, California. That's like a foreign country compared to maybe where <laughs> I live. Um, or you, you might consider where I live very different than where you live. But, but uh, how do you see the, you know, the vast um, um, geographical differences in health care and as we evolve into, you know, this next era of the ACA, uh, how, how do you perceive, you know, this is going to happen and what will it look like? Well, I think what you raise is a really important point, which is that every market is different. Mm. And that if we try to create a one-size-fits-all solution, it's not going to work. Um, and one of the things my organization has worked on is something we call market assessment process. And um, I think we'll be talking about that on a future, future webinar, webinar, right? Yep. Um, where it's really important to take the dynamics of the local market into consideration before you apply some kind of solution. And this is not popular with national employers. It's not popular with national insurance carriers. It's not po popular with uh, pr healthcare providers that span multiple geographies because they want to just have one system and one way of doing things. But the truth is, is every market is different. And when it comes to reference pricing, there might be some markets where it makes a lot of sense, some where it doesn't. Certainly the price that you set at the reference price should vary with what the market dynamics are. So um, I think uh, as much as we would like to have a one-size-fits-all solution, it's going to be a lot harder than that. And we have to take local dynamics into account. And Suzanne, frankly, that's this audience's biggest challenge with the ACA. Mm -hmm. It's a one-size-fits-all solution that reduces flexibility and choice, increases cost, and hurts our ability to serve our clients. So we're talking about health care. We're talking about health care being very local, yet we've asked, we've, we've layered on a, a system that's one-size-fits-all. So how's that going to help us get to where we want to get to? Um, I'm not going to get into a debate about the Affordable Care Act with you. <laughs> um, I, 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 will I thought it. We had a minute left. I thought I'd try. <laughs> I will say that um, I, I think it has also uh, propelled huge amounts of reform that were sorely needed on the payment and healthcare delivery side. And, you know, we can debate choice versus value. And, you know, sometimes they go together and sometimes, sometimes they, they don't. don't. And we don't have enough time with 40 no, seconds don't. left. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, do you have one more? Do we have time for one more question? One quick one. Okay. How do we how do we steer clients towards <coughs> the benefits of a consumer-driven health plan while minimizing the sticker shock of that high deductible? You know, that's a fantastic question, uh, and I don't have an answer for it to be honest with you. Uh, I, I think you know. I go back to I know I sound like a broken record, uh, but until we make healthcare costs transparent, how do we ask people to be responsible for what they're doing? Right. I mean, I can't even imagine. Can you imagine going out to buy a car? and you have no idea how much the car costs, and you right. say, well, send me a bill 60 days from now, and then I'll pay it. Mm -hmm. So no. I, I, I don't, the only answer I can come up with first is until we can create a national law, or at least regulation, that requires providers to be transparent, I'm not quite sure how we make the value proposition of CDH really deliver on its, on its intention, right. which is to lower cost and improve quality. Good. So we're out of time. Mm -hmm. What I'd like to suggest, though, is if everybody uh, could dial in, on July 20th, Suzanne and I will be talking about curbing inappropriate care. We do know there are some estimates that show about 30 percent of our spend in this country is unnecessary or inappropriate care. So I look forward to that webinar series. Likewise. Thank well. you and thank you all Thanks, of you. Thanks, everybody.